spokeswoman for the King of Glory today, Pastor Leah Daughtry. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, everybody. Come on, clap your hands and give the Lord a praise. Oh, you can do better than that. Hallelujah. Has he been good? Come on, praise him like he's done something for you. Praise him like he's been good to you. Praise him like he's made a way. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. We honor the Lord today for all of his excellent mercy. We honor him because he is God, and beside him there is no other. Most of all, we honor him because he made a way for our salvation. Hallelujah. So that we could spend eternity in his presence. I mean, there's not too many people I want to spend eternity with. But God decided before I was born, before my mother met my father, before I was thought of, he decided that he wanted to spend eternity with me. And so I'm glad about that. Are you? Amen. We give, we give honor to God and obviously to our pastor, Michael McBride, my dear brother, my dear friend. And um, the other part of that story is I was sitting at the end of the table going, well, who is this? He got some fire with him. And not the regular kind of fire of agitated people who live to be agitated. But there was something else in his spirit. I said, he kind of, I wonder, maybe he might be. And when I talked with him, I found out that he was Pentecostal like me. I said, that's what that fire is. And so we were immediately knit together as sister and brother. And I've been so thrilled to watch him work his way through Washington and to bring that fire, the fire of the Most High God, into places where it has not been. And so we are grateful for that. I'm grateful to have my sister, Carla Maria. Where's Carla Maria? Carla Maria. She's a, uh, a daughter of the house in Brooklyn, New York, and she lives out this way now. She moved out here several years ago. We still claim her. So I told her I was coming, and she agreed to come and worship with me today. So it's good to see you, beloved sister. I bring you greetings from the House of the Lord Church in Washington, D.C., where I am privileged to serve as pastor, and from the Southeast District, where I am the jurisdictional elder, but most of all from our national presiding minister, the Reverend Dr. Herbert Daughtry, who is also my father. I'm a fifth generation pastor, and dating back to the days of enslavement, and so we're thrilled to be able to share with you today the word of the Lord as he has given it to me. Now, I'm going to break the cardinal rule in Christendom on first Sunday, and I am not going to preach a communion sermon. Y'all pray for me. I woke up this morning and I said, Lord, it's communion Sunday, but you didn't give me a communion message. Are you sure? Lord, are you sure? And he said, daughter, you preach what I gave you, and we will, the people will be blessed. Amen? Amen. So we're delighted to be with you here on this Resistance Sunday as we conclude this week of resistance. But really, we know, even though we mark a time of resistance today, that our resistance is ongoing in this age of Trump. But more than that, we, if, if resistance is the act of nonconformity, to the powers that be, to the systems that be, then our Christianity, our salvation, is a form of resistance. Amen. Amen. Challenging the status quo and challenging what priorities are and ought to be for the ordering our li of our lives in accordance with the word and the way of God. That's an act of resistance. You being here on Sunday morning is an act of resistance when everybody else is at brunch with their Bloody Marys. And everybody else's kids are at the baseball game. Your kids are here. That's an act of resistance that we then carry over into our activism in the world and in the, uh, in the streets. So we're going to be reading today, if I can go right to the word. Now, I know some people say, wear her shoes. She took her shoes off. <laughs> For me, when I preach, I consider the place where I'm preaching to be holy ground. And so I take my shoes off. 
uh, in order to be connected to the Spirit and to the Word of God. So we're reading today in the book of Exodus in the 8th chapter. And I love that on the screen. I'm going to get me one of those. (laughs) Okay. The 8th chapter, starting at the first verse. Then the Lord said to Moses, go back to Pharaoh and announce to him, This is what the Lord says, let my people go so they can worship me. If you refuse to let them go, I will send a plague of frogs across your entire land. The Nile River will swarm with frogs. They will come up out of the river and into your palace, even into your bedroom and onto your bed. They will enter the houses of your officials and your people. They will even jump into your ovens and your kneading bowls. Frogs will jump on you, your people, and all your officials. Then the Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron, raise the staff in your hand over all the rivers, canals, and ponds of Egypt, and bring up all the frogs from all over all the land. So Aaron raised his hand over the waters of Egypt, and frogs came up and covered the whole land. But the magicians were able to do the same thing with their magic. They too caused frogs to come up on the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and begged, plead with the Lord your God to take the frogs away from me and my people and I will let your people go so that they can offer sacrifices to the Lord. You set the time, Moses replied. Tell me when you want me to pray for you, your officials and your people, then you and your houses will be rid of the frogs, and they will remain only in the Nile River. Do it tomorrow, Pharaoh said. All right, Moses replied, it will be as you said, and then you will know that there is no one like the Lord our God. Do it tomorrow, Pharaoh said. Let's pray. Father God, Mother God, Creator God, we bless your name. We thank you for this day, a day you have made and that is like no other that we have seen before. Lord, we ask that you continue to dwell in our midst in this place. Bless your people. Open ears that they may hear. Open hearts that they may receive. Open minds that they may understand. Lord, help us to challenge the comfortable and comfort the challenged. Lord, be with us in our midst. Break open your word. Break open our spirits that we might receive. In the strong and mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. We as Christians have an interesting relationship with time. It's a conundrum for us, really, because we dwell in human time. Chronos, K-R-O-N-O-S, chronos time, human time which measures itself in seconds and minutes and hours and weeks and days and decades and millennia. It's about our calendar, what time we get up, what time we go to rest, what time we go to work, how we see time, how we use time. And yet as kingdom citizens, as those who dwell under the power and the guidance of the Most High God, we are also dealing with Kairos time. K-A-I-R-O-S, God's time. So in a sense, we live in two dimensions. We are citizens of two worlds. It is the here and now on earth, and then there is the future in paradise. In human time, we know there are four seasons, fall season, winter, spring, and summer season. In God's time, there are five seasons. Fall season, winter, spring, and summer season, and then there's due season. We have, God works in a different way than our calendar work, due season. Due season, that's not on the, the calendar that we see in our, in our grocery stores. We live in two seasons. We live in two types of time, but God is present in both. God is present in both. A couple of years ago, there was a popular phrase. Everybody was walking around with T-shirts that said YOLO. You only live once. I didn't buy one of those because I don't plan to live once. I'm living to live again. Anybody else? I'm living to live again. And I understand that how I live today has implications for how I live in the future. The decisions I make in this dimension affect my life in the next dimension. 
Now the danger is always that in our devotion or in our foolishness, we diminish or we disregard our own role, our own responsibility, the responsibility that God gives us to order our steps, to take charge of our own lives, and to make meaningful decisions, to understand the impact of our actions and our words on our life. Life and death is in the power of the tongue after all. To realize the authority that God has given to us to control our own situation, speak the things that are not as though they were, to walk in our God-given ability to change our own circumstances. Speak to this mountain. Be thou removed and cast into the sea, and it shall be done. We have this authority, this ability, this impact, whether we speak to our personal lives and situations, or as we now stand in the aftermath of a contentious presidential campaign, it is crystal clear that we have two starkly different visions of America. One side wants to take us back. One side wants to move us forward. One side is interested in limited or no progress, and the other side wants to expand access to resources. Make no mistake, this is a critical time we're living in. And we, the people of God, have God-given authority and God-given ability to change our circumstances and to make a difference, not just for ourselves, but for the communities where we live. So now this brings us to our message today. I started to call this, now is the time and today is the day. But then I decided I would call it, how to get rid of frogs. how to get rid of frogs. So let's go to the text. Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, had a problem. He had frogs in his life. Now, some of you know there's a difference between the manifested problem and the real problem. My mother says there's the real reason and the good reason. Right? The real problem, in the, in the case of Pharaoh, the manifested problem was frogs. But the real problem was stubbornness. It was a lack of discipline. It was his ego and lack of humility. It manifested itself as frogs. It manifested itself as lice, as gnats, as thunder, as locusts, as darkness, as death. And so Pharaoh, because of his stubbornness, because of his lack of humility, because of his arrogance, finds himself locked in an epic battle with the Most High God. Now maybe the root of his problem was political. Maybe he was concerned about being perceived as weak. Maybe he was concerned about his legacy. What would happen to his future if he gave in to Moses and Moses is God. Maybe his problem, the root, was cultural. After all, this was a battle between the idea of one God and the Egyptian tradition of many gods. Or maybe it was more basic than that. Maybe it was just personal. <laughs> After all, he was warring with Moses, his brother, the one he had grown up with, in the same house with, whom he had comp competed with, with for the, his father's affections. So it was personal for him. But regardless of why, the fact is Pharaoh unwittingly foolishly locks horns with the God of the angel armies. Now, how many of you know that God wins every battle he fights? See, so he winds up with frogs. Now, the problem with frogs is that, number one, they're uncontainable. They are known for their ability to jump. So they can leap anywhere. You can't catch them because they're moving too fast. Number two, they're noisy. They're croaking all hours of the day or night. There's no quiet to be found. If you've ever stayed in a hotel or lived near a pond and those frogs are no respecter <laughs> of person and no respecter of the hour. They just croaking, 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 and there's nothing you can do about it. And the third thing is frogs are slimy. 
their skin emits a substance that lets you know that they've been where they've been because they leave a mark wherever they go. Now, this is not a commentary on your housekeeping. And I seriously doubt you have frogs invading your home. Unless it's that problem, that challenge, that situation that you've been dealing with that seems to have taken over your life. It started as one thing. You thought you could handle it. You thought you could contain it. And then it spread like wildfire, invading every area of your life, relationships, financial issues, health, and for all of its characteristics, your problem, your challenge, your situation starts to look and feel like frogs. Jumping into every corner of your life, calling to you at all hours of the day and the night, and leaving a sticky mark wherever it touches so that everything else becomes infected too. And before you know it, you, like the king of Egypt, have a frog problem too. Now when Pharaoh becomes overwhelmed and reaches the end of his rope and he can no longer live with the problem, you know what we do? We cry out. He calls to Moses. He says, please entreat your God to get rid of these frogs. And Pharaoh claims the victory, glory to God. He's seen the light. When do you want me to do it? And Pharaoh says, tomorrow. Now I want to lift out a couple things in this text. Tomorrow. <laughs> Tomorrow, you got frogs everywhere. In your kitchen, in your oven, in the pots, in your room, in the bed, underneath the sheets. They are everywhere and you want to wait till tomorrow? Just on his face, it's a ridiculous answer. Why would he want to wait another day to be rid of the frogs? Clearly, Pharaoh believes that God is able. Clearly, he believes that God will get it done. He, will, he knows that God will do it if he asks. So, but he wants to wait till tomorrow. Why on earth? Why? But wait, that's what we do. Tomorrow, I'll deal with it tomorrow. I start my diet tomorrow. I put him out tomorrow. I'ma tell her to leave, I'ma lose her number tomorrow. I'll be at work on time tomorrow. I'ma praise God tomorrow. Why, let's go back to where we started. The challenge, the problem, the battle we are facing right now in our lives did not just start today. It has a root cause. It has an underlying foundation. That man did not just follow you home, take up residence, and start leaving his socks all over your house. That woman did not get crazy today. She was crazy when you met her. Your kids did not just start talking out the side of their neck yesterday. You taught them how to treat you. You did not just gain 30 pounds. Obamacare did not just go on the chopping block. Trump did not just get elected. Societal pressures, the influences of racism, sexism, classism, the daily messages we are bombarded with. Too fat, too thin, too tall, too short, too dark, too light, too poor, too young, too old, that we are insufficient, that we are not good enough, that we are not equal enough, that we are so strong and so intense and so profound that they cause us to lose sight of who we are in the eyes of God, our creator. 
But I come to let you know, to remind you today of who you really are. You are made in the image and the likeness of God. God created man in his own image. In his own image created he him. Male and female created he them. You are a reflection of the living God. You were created to be like God, powerful, wise, loving, creative, intelligent, compassionate, and just. You were made to have dominion over the things that God created, to have authority. And because of our authority, we are encouraged to come to God, to his throne, to seek him. And now the second thing I want you to see. After Moses says tomorrow, after Pharaoh says tomorrow, Moses replies, be it according to your word. You shall have what you say. This reinforces the power of our word. We have already established that we are made in the image and the likeness of God. That we are endowed with the qualities of our creator. Creative and intelligent and kind and just and merciful. That we've been crowned with glory and honor. And that we have dominion over the works of God. God calls things into existence just by his word. The last thing God made with his hands was man. Everything else he created was through his word, just by what God says. In the beginning, God said, let there be and there was. We see God transferring his authority to us as humankind. He brings the animals to Adam, and Adam said, whatever Adam calls them is what they are. You shall have whatsoever you say. Call those things which are not as though they were. I say unto you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. So the timetable for your deliverance is set by what you say. The timetable for your victory is set by what you say. Pharaoh could have been delivered that minute. But he chose to wait until the next day. The timetable for your change is set by what you do, by the actions that you take. You can continue to sit with your frogs or you can make a change. You can continue, we can continue to complain about what the white people did, what the white people doing, or we can confront racism and classism and sexism wherever we find it. We can continue to mourn our lost children or we can get up off our couches and up off our knees and join with like-minded people and march and fight and work to end over-policing, to end mass incarceration. We can do this now or we can do it tomorrow. The third thing I want you to see is he says, I will let your people go so that they can serve me. It wasn't freedom for freedom's sake. It was freedom with a purpose. They were being set free. The goal was to set them free so that they could worship the living God. So that they could serve the living God. Sometimes we make the struggle an idol in our lives. We lift it up higher than God and we struggle for struggle's sake. And we forget the foundational reason of why we are fighting, why we are struggling. It is so that all of God's people can live the just and free lives that God intended for them to have. So the question for you is, why are you struggling? The Bible says we struggle so that we can serve him. We struggle so that we can worship him. Are you worshiping God today? Why are you in the struggle? Why are you here? Why are you marching? Why are you fighting? Why are you, why are you doing the work that you're doing? God says, I'm freeing you to serve me. You serve me by helping to bring the kingdom of God into the earth. You serve me by helping to make sure that all of God's people have their fair share of the resources. You, you serve me by being a reflection of me here on earth as you are in heaven. So what are you doing? What are you serving God for? What is it that you're speaking into your own lives? You can be healed tomorrow or you can be healed today. You can be delivered tomorrow or you can be delivered today. You can get the victory tomorrow 
or you can get the victory today. The timing is up to you. It depends on what you say. So what are you declaring in your life? Are you declaring lack? Well, the Bible says that the cattle on a thousand hills belong to God. If you're saying, I can't help it, it's part of me, it's the way my mama was, my daddy was, Uncle Bebe was, this is how it is. The Bible says, I can do all things. Hallelujah, through Christ who gives me strength. If it's fatigue, I'm tired. My mind is tired. The Bible says the joy of the Lord is my strength. If you're saying I'm weak, oh, his his strength is made perfect in my weakness. I don't have enough. Well, my grace is sufficient for you. I'm sick. He was wounded, hallelujah, for my transgressions, and he was bruised for my iniquities. What are you declaring in your life? When are you looking for your deliverance? When are you willing to make the change that is necessary to see the manifestation of God in your life? You can live another day in an abusive situation or you can put her out today. You can live another day with disrespect in your life or you can end it today. You can live the way you've been living with lack in your life or you can say today is the last day. You have whatsoever you say. It's up to you to make the change. It depends on what you believe. It depends on what you're willing to do. It depends on the change you're willing to make. What are you declaring in your life? What are you willing to do? Where are you willing to be? How far are you willing to go? And I want you to see Pharaoh didn't have to do anything but say today. He didn't have to jump no pews. He didn't have to run down no aisles. He didn't have to spin around three times. He didn't have to touch his neighbor. All he had to do was say today, and he would have been delivered. Are you willing to say today? Is there anybody here who's ready for God to make a way today? Is there anybody who wants deliverance today? Is there anybody who's seeking the Lord today? Is there anybody who wants a difference today? Then clap your hands. Give God glory. Come on, somebody, and give him the praise. Come on, clap your hands. Come on, call out to him, Lord. Hallelujah. I'm looking for you today, Lord. I need it today, Lord. I can't wait another day. I don't have another hour. I don't have another minute. I need deliverance today. I need salvation today. I need 